We're going to have to get this party started if we're actually going to finish anything close to on time today. So if everyone will just take their seats and settle down. And we'll continue the conversations later. No, I'm not going to succeed in this, am I? I am talking to myself. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. I was just going to invite you all to settle down so we can begin our keynote talk tonight. Thank you so much for being here. In fact, I was, I was going through my list of thank yous, which I finally decided I could never possibly do because I would have to include everyone in the room as well as many people who aren't here right now. In order to set up the keynote talk, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about where the conference came from. Um, this conference, for me, began with a dear friend, Ashana Haley, who um, passed away a couple of years ago, but who was a great believer in the powerful potential for good in simple chemistry, and a great believer, actually, in psychedelic drugs and their therapeutic potentials. And because of that, she left money in her estate and her legacy to support MAPS the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, who we have on hand today. Some of you may have met them over dinner, and they'll be here again during the reception after this talk um, to answer questions, to talk about their research, which has been, at least with regards to the most recent breakthroughs, really amazingly hopeful work for uh, the general problem of treating trauma. Um, recently, MAPS has had a major breakthrough in the use of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, a breakthrough which has just blown out of the water previous therapies that deal with um, intractable cases of post-traumatic stress disorder, people who've suffered for years and years, 10, even 20 years without any remission, people who have gone through drug therapies and psychotherapies um, and still struggle and suffer. And although there is no magic pill in the world, MDMA with the uh, psychotherapy appears to have been a very powerful breakthrough. And we can only assume that this is because of the ways in which it, it enhances trust and helps begin to build those bridges that rebuild the relationships that are so shattered by trauma. After this breakthrough, and um, because of Ashana's interest in supporting MAPS, um, her brother, Kim Haley, has been taking over her estate, has helped to promote the work that Ashana believed in. And it was through Kim that I came to know about this breakthrough uh, from MAPS. Um, and he's been working over the past few years to help MAPS bring this research to a more uh, public awareness, um, trying to get the, the VA, for example, the Veterans Administration, to pay attention to this breakthrough research, uh, given how they have struggled, um, quite genuinely struggled. And I, I have a family member in the VA system as a patient, so I know the struggles from the inside, unfortunately. Um, and they've really struggled to, to actually deal with the problem of trauma um, and the, the magnitude of the post-traumatic stress disorder that they're dealing with among the troops. In the process of reaching out to everyone that he could think of, Kim Haley uh, encountered Richard Rockefeller, who was a physician and a humanitarian and a philanthropist and who for many years worked with Doctors Without Borders. He also worked with the Rockefeller Foundation. And he got involved in promoting some of MAP's research, actually came out to California to give a talk with the Commonwealth Club a couple of years ago. But before he came out to give that talk, he, he began to, to think about the problems of uh, not just post-traumatic stress disorder, but collective trauma, the problem of, of trauma on a mass scale. And this is the kind of trauma that Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, deals with all the time in their work. Um, and of course, their first and immediate uh, attention has always been to sort of physical medicine, but there's a very strong interest in that group to try to begin to deal with the trauma issue. Um, and so in that, in the conversations that happened building up to that Commonwealth Club talk, I was drawn in as a kind of historical consultant. For those of you who don't know me, my specialty is actually 15th century demonology and Swiss city-states. So. Um, <laughs> It wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, it does connect, but since we don't have an hour for my dissertation at this moment in time, I'll just leave that to the side. Um, but I did do a lot of research uh, when, when Richard asked me to, to look into um, what kinds of healing processes historically have taken place um, and what kinds of responses to mass trauma have taken place. And we did a lot of reading and research. We created this research group to actually answer the question. 
And what we learned is that there's a very rich and diverse literature, a literature that is growing in many different fields, a literature in which um, specialists in ethnicity studies and specialists in psychotherapy are both contributing and sometimes not speaking to each other, although sometimes those, those two in particular do speak to each other pretty well. But the number of different disciplines, the number of different paths, indeed the number of people involved in this field who are not academics at all, mind-blowing to me as a quintessential academic who just lives within the ivory tower here at Stanford, I was really, really, really surprised by some of the powerful insights coming out of experiential therapies, the, kind, the, the idea that you learn something by doing that you can't learn intellectually. So one of the reasons I wanted to create this conference was so that we could learn from all the experiential therapists that I was meeting along the way. In those conversations leading up to that Commonwealth Club talk, I understand that Kim Haley and Richard Rockefeller came into conversation with Larry Brilliant, who is one of our local philanthropists, the founder of the Skoll Foundation, uh, which is oriented on the idea that, that some problems are big enough to co constitute global threats and that we need to address those problems kind of holistically. And, and Larry Brilliant had put on his list of things to be concerned about as global threats, the problem of mass trauma. Not just because uh, we live in an age of ongoing warfare, being an early modernist, I can tell you this is not new, but also because we live in a time when we recognize that we can communicate our trauma so much further that it actually does begin to reinforce itself and become um, a kind of process of cycling. These intergenerational cycles, which Steve Olween talked about in his plenary talk this afternoon, can be very dangerous. They can lead whole societies into a state of difficulty and disorder that it's very difficult to climb back out of. And of course, we see in, in the case of some of the early modern traumas, like the Middle Passage and the um, violent colonization of North America, we still, do, still see those legacies playing out today. Um, and in watching those legacies play out, we also learn a lot about resilience and strength. When we, we look at the ways that those, the Native American communities and the African American communities have, have built their own sense of identity that is supportive of strength and healing and resilience. So actually in that study, there is, there is a lot to learn from the academic perspective about how healing happens and how healing happens collectively. But there are still many, many questions and we certainly weren't able to answer them there at the Commonwealth Club talk, although we brought them all together at that time. And in those conversations as well, there was the, the beginnings of the questions of epigenetics. Before we get to that though, I want to tell you why we actually did start this conference. And that was a very tragic event, the death of Richard Rockefeller, which was a shock to us just about a year ago when we heard of it. Um, and upon hearing of his death, Kim came to talk to me and we were distressed to hear that our friend was gone. And he said, there's something, we should do something to continue his work. And I said, you know, I think the diversity of this group of seekers, I mean, some of us are scholars and some of us are practitioners of other kinds, but we're all seeking, I think, an answer to some of these pressing questions. I said, I think this group needs more conversations. Of course, it was after that that I learned about Steve Olween's wonderful work in conferences, but I think we could have a lot more of these conferences and that they would pay off. And so this conference is in the memory of Richard Rockefeller. And for that reason, I've asked Maeve, uh, his widow, to speak to us briefly about his life and his vision, which inspired me and inspired this conference. Maeve. Thank you, Laura. And a big thank you to Stanford University for hosting the conference. Richard would be very pleased. There was nothing he liked better than to be in a room filled with highly intelligent, creative, committed, and compassionate people engaged in finding ways to solve some of the world's most intractable problems. I won't describe all the ways that my husband was special, but I can give you some idea of the qualities of his heart and his mind and his spirit, which made him a wonderful, advocate for raising awareness for trauma and which drove him in his later years to pursue effective treatments for traumatized populations. He was a scientist. He had a brilliant intellect. He loved the pursuit of knowledge. He was a humanitarian who cared about the human condition. He was an environmentalist who loved this planet and he was a philanthropist who was committed to 
doing his part in alleviating suffering in this world. But perhaps the best word to describe him was healer. And Richard's passion for healing began when he chose family medicine as his career. In his practice, he diagnosed individuals with depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, and stress. And back in those days, stress disorder treatment was basically dealt with through cognitive behavioral therapy and medicine. But Richard would search for alternative ways to help his patients, recommending meditation, body work, yoga, exercise, journaling, expressive arts, anything that would resonate, anything that would bring relief to his patients. Richard's 21 years chairing the U.S. Advisory Board for Doctors Without Borders expanded his understanding of trauma. During his tenure with MSF, he visited numerous countries and served as a volunteer doctor on several humanitarian aid missions in areas wracked by conflict, disease, and malnutrition. Richard also chaired Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and one of the pivotal places that they worked was in Kosovo. And we heard earlier today that Kosovo was, was filled with populations that had been traumatized by the war. And Richard saw firsthand there how the peace building activities in Kosovo was really a heavy lift because the Kosovars and the Serbs were not going to work together. So these experiences um, really informed Richard and he began to view trauma as a global health issue. And his greatest concern was how trauma perpetuated itself. He believed that breaking the cycle would be critical to the future well-being of generations to come and also to the health of our planet. A few years ago, Richard met Rick Doblin and Michael Mithoffer with MAPS, who we heard about, and he was galvanized by the prospect of addressing trauma on a large scale. And Richard learned about the MAPS-approved um, studies using MDMA along with psychotherapy to treat PTSD because these studies were showing such promising long-term outcomes, he took it upon himself to try to reach out to the Department of Defense and the VA um, to talk with them about potential collaboration. The good news is that Rick and Michael and Richard were successful. The VA is actually going to start four proof-of-concept studies beginning this fall. Um, if Richard were here today, he'd be looking forward to learning more about the people and the organizations that are developing innovative treatments for PTSD. He would be seeking allies amongst all of you in the quest for accelerating approval for the therapeutic use of MDMA. And he would want to absorb all the information you have about epigenetics and multi-generational trauma. He might just share his Commonwealth talk. He was a little bit humble. Um, but he'd also share the good news that Rockefeller University just recently agreed to study the neuroscience of MDMA's effect on the brain. Richard was inspired by and happy to be a part of a growing community of people who are willing to spend their time and talent finding solutions to this major health issue. If he were here today, he would, express, he would be expressing his profound gratitude to all of you. And I like to think of him continuing to move his legacy of health and hope forward just in a different realm. Thank you. Thank you, Maeve. And thank you, everyone, for being here and for making this conference such a wonderful success already. It is now my pleasure to take us in a whole new direction to introduce Michael Skinner, who will be speaking to us today about his work. I think he'll be challenging us to think on a completely different level. He's a molecular biologist who specializes in epigenetics and the effects of, of toxins and changing the epigene and um, affecting all aspects of reproduction. I'll give you a brief introduction to Dr. Skinner. He's a professor in the School of Biological Sciences at Washington State University. I'm proud to say he did his BS in chemistry at Reed College because I'm also a Reedy. 
and I'm very fond of that institution, uh, which appears to produce a lot of PhDs in the long run. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a larval professor's home. If you want to send your, your kid off to be a professor, send them to Reed College. And then afterwards studied both at Washington State University and at the CH, Be CH Best Inter uh, Institute at the University of Toronto. His research is actually focused on the investigation of a gonadal growth and differentiation. This is about human reproduction and animal reproduction. I, I assume mostly mammals, but I don't even know that. With emphasis on the area of reproduction biology, his research has demonstrated the ability of environmental toxins to promote the epigenetic transgenerational inheritance of disease phenotypes due to abnormal germline epigenetic programming and gonadal development. I hope you all got that really clear. I've asked him to translate some of his work for us today, so I hope he'll be able to do that. I'm actually probably not capable of translating his work. Um, Dr. Skinner is very prolific. He has over 250 peer-reviewed publications and has given over 250 invited symposia, plenary lectures, and university seminars, to which he can no doubt add one more. He's also the director of the Washington State University and University of Idaho Center for Reproductive Biology and the director of the Center for Integrated Biotechnology. In addition to working in these two centers, he has um, received many awards and has been highlighted often in the public media. In fact, the way that I first encountered uh, Michael Skinner's work was, I think, in a Scientific American article, um, which I could understand pretty well. I have a, a basis in biology, but it's been a very long time, so I was pleased to find that he was able to translate that biological work for a sort of lay intellectual audience, which in terms of biology, I at least am in. So I'm very pleased to have him here with us today, and we will thank, thank, thank Michael Skimmer for coming to talk to us. I think I have the name of your talk, but, oh, here it is. Is this the name of your talk? Yep. Environmentally Induced Epigenetic Transgenerational Inheritance of Disease. So join me in thanking Michael Skinner for coming to Well, thanks very much. I want to thank Laura and the organizers for the kind invitation. It is truly an honor to talk in a meeting that's dedicated to Richard. Uh, it's uh, he's working the PTSD. You know, the academics at my level have, have known about that. So today, and the reason I please is I could actually hopefully give you some insights on where the disease comes from, in terms of the underlying basics for that, as well as most other diseases. That'd be great. Then if I move, then you can okay. wander around if you want to. Right. You could be a rock star. <laughs> Although I have to admit I had trouble turning this thing on before. There's an on button. You're supposed to hold it. There you go. I've used a few of them. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, and I sat through most of the sessions today, is really different. So I'm a molecular biologist, and so what I'm going to talk about is somewhat the basics or the origins for where disease comes from. And, and essentially, many of the things that I heard today have a molecular cause, there's a reason for that to occur, okay? And so what I'm going to talk about is that process. By knowing this, it actually gives you insights on how to treat and understand the disease. Okay, and I'm going to give you specific examples during the talk of an environmental factor, sometimes a stress effect, which influences then the great-grandchildren of the person affected, and they're going to pass it on to their great-grandchildren. So this becomes what's called epigenetic inheritance. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about is transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. It's a little bit different than the way you were using the term transgenerational today. But in essence, if it keeps going generationally, our mechanism's involved. Okay, so this is, tr this is um, somewhat genetic heresy for me to say that there's a whole other form of inheritance that doesn't involve genetics, okay? That would have, I mean, there's still a lot of geneticists that are very upset about that, okay? <laughs> Truly. And so I'm gonna talk about how the environment Everything from environmental chemicals to stress, how this can induce a concept called epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. At the end of the talk, if you don't understand what these ancestral ghosts are, then I didn't do my job in terms of you understanding it. Okay? So I'll talk about these ancestral ghosts in your genome. So first, I'm going to give you a preamble on where science sits today. 
and it's been that way for the past 100 years, and why it's only been in the last decade that we've sort of pushed this envelope to consider something else besides genetics. All right, I'll stand in front of this and use this. So hopefully that'll work. So there's a concept in science today that's been around for the past 100 years, and it's called genetic determinism. All right? The idea is you have a DNA molecule that has a DNA sequence. In that DNA molecule, there's a whole series of genes that get expressed. And essentially, the idea is that this DNA sequence, if it's abnormal, if there's a mutation, then that'll change what genes, the expression, what genes are on and off, okay? That then will change the physiology of the individual tissue, and if it's abnormal, then you'll get a disease, okay? That's the current paradigm for where disease comes from, okay? And it's called genetic determinism, and it's been in place for truly over 100 years, and it's still today the predominant mechanism considered in molecular biology, and the only one. Okay, so because of this, everything is geared towards genetics. Over 90% of all NIH funding is geared towards genetic determinism. Over 90% of all pharmaceuticals generated are generated for DNA sequence mutations. What we do in science, and particularly the biological science, is geared solely for genetics. The problem with that is there's been observations for the past 50 years, at least, that have said, wait a second, there's something else going on here. If you take re anywhere, go anywhere in the world, each region of the world has different disease frequencies. Sometimes they'll have, have high cancer rates, sometimes they'll have stomach cancer, that sort of thing. So let me give you an example. In Japan, you have exceedingly high stomach disease and exceedingly low prostate disease in males, okay? In North America, we have very low stomach disease really through the roof high levels of prostate disease, okay? If you take someone from Japan before the age of five, move them to North America and let them grow up, guess what? They develop the susceptibility to get prostate disease. Okay, I'm sorry, this can't be genetics. It has to be an environmentally induced phenomena in that individual, okay? And this, there's, that's just one example. There's hundreds of examples given by epidemiologists for the past 50 years where environment is driving the disease onset or at least the increase in, in the frequency. If you take almost uh, any disease you want to think about, from cancer, prostate disease, uh, autism, whatever, whatever disease you want to look at, okay, and you actually look at the n amount of patients with a, with a genetic mutation in that population. This is called a genome-wide association study. And, we, and the NIH has spent probably half a billion dollars on this type of studies over the past 10 years. Conceptually, they would take a thousand breast cancer patients and they would actually take and sequence their entire genomes and it's looking for a mutation that would correlate with the disease, okay? In most cases, not all, but most cases, they have found some mutations. The problem is, truly, this is in less than 1% of that thousand population that has the genetic mutation. So they're, ha they're happy they got the mutation. But I would say, what about the 99% that don't have the mutation? Where'd their disease come from? So it's not that genetics isn't absolutely critical and important. It just can't explain most of our disease, okay? And including PTSD and all these sort of behavioral sort of things as well. So in, t in terms of any, almost most diseases, if you think about this, just your experience over the past 20 or 30 years, the percentage of increase in diseases, in many cases, is almost an order of magnitude over the past 20 or 30 years. Tenfold increase in disease frequencies. I'm sorry, again, you cannot explain that with genetics. There's no genetic mechanism that could give you that high of a frequency. It has to be an environmentally induced phenomenon, okay? If you take identical twins, supposedly they have almost the same genetics. It's not the same, but it's almost the same genetics. If it was all genetics, when they grew up, they would have the same disease. But if, in fact, if you look at twins across the board, they have discordant disease between twins. They don't get the same diseases. 
and again, the environment's driving this disease onset. Okay. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of environmental exposures, mostly compounds, that have a direct correlation with whether there's a disease. Okay. The vast majority of these don't have the capacity to change DNA sequence. Very, very few things are actually mutagenic. All of those pesticides you hear about are the plastics and so forth that we are exposed to on a daily basis. Those can't cause genetic mutations. They're just, they're not mutagens. Yet there's a direct correlation with whether there's a disease onset. Okay? And I'll talk about this very briefly in the end, but there's a whole thing, a bunch of things in evolution, rapid evolutionary events, which you also can't explain with genetics very easily. So it's all, it's all across all biological fields, not just disease. Okay? So, it appears there has to be something else that regulates how that DNA sequence or the genome functions. Okay? Well, of course, what I'm going to talk about is what's called epigenetics. Okay? And epigenetics has the ability to directly regulate how the DNA functions. Okay? And it's completely independent from genetics. So now I'm going to, and, and through the talk, I'm going to present a bunch of slides that have science on them. So don't get too upset, I'm going to ex uh, summarize all of the slides, okay? So I don't expect you to understand necessarily when a slide pops up, but I will explain what the slide means, okay? But I, want, I wanted to show the data because I don't want you to leave thinking that there's not data to support what I'm talking about. There's a whole bunch of data to actually support what we're talking about, okay? All right, so epigenetics. Epigenetics are molecular factors and processes, truly molecular level, around the DNA, so they literally, literally exist around the DNA, okay? And they can regulate what genome activity, in other words, which genes are on and off, okay? And it's completely independent of the DNA sequence. It doesn't matter what the sequence is. If the epigenetics is there, it'll shift the genes turning on and off, okay? If it was dependent on a sequence of DNA, it would be genetics, okay? This is not dependent. So therefore, it's a completely different thing than genetics. Right? But it's directly related. So it's not, you, could, you can't really pull these things apart. They are integrated to a level that the integration means that if I was to suggest, I'd say there's never going to be an epigenetic-only phenomena. It's just like there'll never be a genetic-only phenomena. These two things work together on everything, okay? So it's molecular factors around the DNA, regulate what genes are on and off, independent of DNA sequence, and probably most importantly, it's mitotically stable. So when a cell divides into two daughter cells, that's called mitosis, okay? We know that the DNA in the parent cell gets replicated so that it basically it's exactly the same in the daughter cells. So the DNA is replicated. So guess what? The epigenome, also gets replicated. So it's exactly the same in the daughter cells as it was the parent cell, okay? And there's mechanisms for that, which I'll talk, just give you one example during the talk. If it wasn't, if it wasn't replicated during growth, it would be irrelevant. If you had an effect on the epigenome and it basically it disappeared when the cells grew, it would have no effect if it's not mitotically stable. So let me give you an example. So let's say you're a female, you're about 12 years old, you're entering puberty. When you enter puberty, or the male's doing the same thing uh, going through the puberty. For the male, it's prostate development. For the female, it's mammary development, okay? So let's say you get exposed to extensive levels of bisphenol A and plastics during that next couple years. Because of that exposure, if it go, goes into the mammary epithelial cell, because it's now just starting to develop, and shifts the epigenome, which I'll give you examples of in a minute, because the same cells then are undergoing, undergoing growth and mitosis, 40 years or 50 years later, you still have that shift in the epigenome. Guess what? It's changing what genes are on and off. Therefore, you have a susceptibility to develop breast cancer from that early life exposure. That's why mitotic stability is a very critical aspect of the definition for epigenetics, okay? It has to be somewhat, it's a long-term thing. It's not a transient thing. All right, so this is sort of the more current definition for epigenetics. So epigenetics, as I mentioned, are molecular factors around the DNA. The first one that was identified was DNA methylation. This is a small me methyl group. It's a chemical. that It's chemically attached to the DNA, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute, too. 
by, by essentially going on to that, you can actually influence what genes are on and off. Okay? Another thing is the DNA isn't naked. Basically, it's wrapped around a group of proteins called histones. And the histones form a little core, and the DNA gets wrapped around it. 100, it's 180 base pairs around this thing. Okay? And there's several different histones that make up this core, and this is called a nucleosome. So when we actually see the DNA, it's a bunch of beads on a string, essentially. Okay? You can have chemical modifications of the histones, methylations and acetylations and so forth, which will change how the DNA functions. So it's, again, that's an epigenetic process as well. Another one is chromatin structure, whether you got tight coils or whether you got a loop or whether it's stuck to the nuclear matrix. In other words, the structure of the DNA can influence what genes are on and off, independent of sequence. So it's epigenetic as well. And the last one, or more, uh, the newer one, is called non-coding RNA. Essentially, you have stretches of RNA that don't code proteins. And, the, and they, they, don't, they basically have functions independent of a, trans, a translation into proteins, okay? And those are, those are also can be epigenetic as well, okay? So that's, those are the four main functions or main factors in epigenetics, okay? All right. So what I'm going to talk about in epigenetics and biology is how the environment through epigenetics can influence disease etiology. In other words, how epigenetics is related to this disease etiology. I'll talk about how the epigenetics provides a mechanism for ancestral and early life uh, exposures that can influence adult onset disease. So the mechanisms for the developmental basis of disease. I'll also talk about this concept called non-genetic inheritance. Okay? And so in this, if you're going to have inheritance, if you think about it, the only cell that is involved in inheritance is your germ cell your sperm or your egg, okay? If your sperm or egg don't pass something forward, it's not gonna go to the next generation. You're, if you have mammary tumor or something, you can't pass that on necessarily unless it's based in your DNA. And so essentially, this germ line is absolutely critical for inheritance. So I'm gonna talk about non-genetic inheritance where the germ line's involved in terms of uh, epigenetics, okay? And then this concept of non-genetic inheritance is called epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. So I'll define that during the talk. So these are the topics that I'm going to sort of address. So if you think about it, you can pick your disease of interest and basically plug it in there. So I'm going to go through the steps to actually get that disease. So essentially, we started out by doing an exposure here. Uh, usually, we use chemicals, but now it's been done with stress, nutrition, whole series of environmental type, type, type activities of a gestating female, okay, sort of early stages of gestation, just transiently, and then it was removed. And what we found, and then we would breed this animal to the F1 generation, and then we bred it to the F2 generation, and F3 generation, F4. We went out four generations from the actual exposure. The only one that was exposed was this gestating what's called the F0 generation. The next generation is F1, this is F2, this is F3, and this is F4, okay? And so, uh, so I'll mention these F2s and F3s and 4s, that's what that means, okay? It's whether it's the ch child, the grand offspring, the great grand offspring, or the great great grand offspring, okay? All right. So the first observation we made was with a chemical called vinclozolin. Vinclozolin, this is this chemical structure. It's, it's the most commonly used fungicide worldwide in agriculture. It's used predominantly in the fruit and vegetable industry. Okay? Vinclozolin basically is antiandrogenic. It blocks the ability of the male hormone testosterone to bind to its receptor. Okay? So it's antiandrogenic. So this is andro androgen that's binding to the receptor. And many compounds can be antiestrogenic in terms of binding it to the estrogen receptor in the females and so forth. So these are called... These, are these chemicals that interfere with hormone action. And it had been shown that this would cause late embryonic gonadal development and, and germ cell produ production. That's why we looked at it in the first place. And here it just shows an individual spraying vinclozolin on uh, and in a vineyard. Okay? Now, nobody would freak out because vinclozolin has a relatively short half-life, uh, and, so, and it breaks down fairly quickly. So the only person that's really it's going to be a hazard to is the guy spraying it. But it also is, is, is eliminated by the time you get wine. So everybody can drink wine. You have to worry about being closed on. Uh, uh, but it's a good model compound. That's why we selected it. 
plus it, it is a heavily used in agricultural compound. So what we found was, if we looked at the testis, we did a cross section of the testis, of the F1 generation, F2 generation, all four generations, we found that developing sperm cells in the testis would start to undergo cell death. That's called apoptosis. So we had a high degree of cell death of the germ cell that was developing, lower sperm counts and lower motility. Okay, and then basically if we took the male and, and outbred it to a, a wild type female, we still got the phenotype. If we took the female and outbred it, we lost the phenotype. So with this particular compound, the effects are going through the male germline, not the female germline, okay? So this is going through the sperm, okay? So this disease that I'm gonna talk about is going through the sperm, and so that's one of the reasons. Now we have subsequently found a whole series of things that go through the female, or we have a bunch of them that are mixed, okay? So with females can transfer it, this one was just going through the male though, okay? So we had a, this generational effect, but the only exposure was back here at the F0. So why would you have an F3 or F4 generation effect? Uh, because you weren't gonna induce a genetic mutation. How are you inheriting this effect? Okay, so that's what drove us, this is observations actually drove us into the field about 15 years ago. So if we let these animals age, what we found was in the first generation, we had a whole series of diseases, uh, mammary tumors in males, which don't normally happen, uh, prostate disease in 40%, uh, kidney disease, uh, test testis disease, uh, and then immune abnormalities. At the F2 generation, it actually went up. At the F3 generation, it was the same sort of level, or went up. At the F4 generation, it was there as well. So essentially, normal, in normal genetics, if you have an effect, what you generally see as you bring in new genetics is a decline in the frequency, okay? It's called segregation. But basically, as you bring in new genetics, everything declines. So usually about four or five generations, you're gonna lose whatever phenotype you're looking at. Ours didn't go away. Okay, so this is what you would call a non-Mendelian genetic phenomena. Okay, so this is what, another reason we looked heavily at epigenetics. Okay, but there was a high degree of development. In fact, 87% or something like that of the animals developed generally more than two diseases. Okay, so the next thing was we looked at compound specificity. We took at a whole series of compounds. So we took the vinclozone as a positive control, uh, another antiandrogen, which was the pharmaceutical called flutamide, dioxin, the plastics, bisphenol A and the phthalates, the jet fuel in terms of like a diesel mixture, uh, pesticides that are commonly used in humans called DEET and permethrin, it's the most common thing in humans, DDT, which is the heavily used pesticide, and then the replacement for DDT, methoxychlor. Every single one of these, except this, this pharmaceutical, promoted, <laughs> and it's really nice to have a negative, uh, but all of the other ones promoted a transgenerational effect. So I'll give you an example just of a couple of these. I can't get heavily into, in the uh, pathology because there's just too much data. So the first disease I want to look at is polycystic ovarian disease. Okay? If you don't know, the number one <coughs> reproductive disease in women today, almost worldwide, is polycystic ovarian disease. Up to 18% of women will get polycystic ovarian disease, 10 to 18%, depending on where you live. Okay? And it, what this does is it has very large cysts in the ovary, and the ovary doesn't start functioning. They don't produce the normal hormones. It's an endocrine effect. It can cause infertility. There can be some pain associated with it. And so this is a really a major problem in aging women. Is this poly and it's gone up tenfold in the last 25 or 30 years. Okay? So this is, this is something that's come up. Now, in the F1 generation, we essentially only found that the plastics, the bisphenol A, has caused this polycystic ovarian disease. If we looked at the F F3 generation, the great grand offspring, essentially every single compound that would, would cause this polycystic ovarian disease, okay? So this is a big deal because we're actually affecting the ovary and it correlates very well with the disease we're seeing in the human population. Now another disease, sorry about showing that these pictures, but uh, essentially for obesity, uh, what we found was if we use DDT, this is where it was a huge surprise to us. In the F1 generation, we did not see in either females or males any effect of DDT. But in the F3 generation, over 50% of the females and 50% of the males developed obesity. 
they increase their growth. And, and basically what this shows is that here's a non-obese and here's an obese. The, this this uh, abdominal fat deposition, which is a major marker for obesity. Uh, there's diabetes associated with, there's a bunch of things associated. This is, a, uh, this is basically with the obese. So with this obesity, we found a number of correlated diseases that are known in the human to be correlated with this as well, okay? 50% of the population, both males and females, from DDT, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later, okay? So essentially, if we looked at the different diseases, we had male testis effects, female ovary effects, we had uh, increase in tumors and mammary tumors, both males and females, prostate disease, kidney disease. These are most of the major diseases you want to think about in the human population. Okay? We also had some significant behavioral effects, mate preference, anxiety, stress, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And so in, in the frequencies, are, it's like 90% had the behavioral effects, or 90% had the spermatogenic growth. And so these are very high frequency events. In fact, this level of indeed disease onset is really very difficult to actually show with any other sort of model system. Okay. All right, so if you think about your exposure, we expose a gestating female here, went out three generations. If you expose the gestating female, which is the F1, the F0 population, there's a fetus that's the F, F1 population that's inside that female, okay? And the germline that's gonna generate the grand offspring is in that, inside that F1 fetus. So therefore, if you do an exposure of a gestating female, essentially you're exposing three generations. And so essentially, you go, the F1 is due to the fetal exposure and F2 is due to that germline exposure. It's not until you get to the F3 from a gestating female, that you truly have a transgenerational effect. You have a multi-generational effect up front, and then you have a transgenerational if you go to the F3. So this to give you an example. So for a gestating female, you have to get to the F3 to get transgenerational. Before that, it's multi-generational or intergenerational, okay? For the uh, adult that's not pregnant, both male or female, okay? If you expose them, the F0 generation's exposed, and the germline that's going to generate the offspring is also directly exposed. And now, in the past five years, there's a dozen studies showing that if they expose either adult males or females, they can pass things on not only to their offspring, but to their grand offspring, which is the F2, which is a transgenerational for this exposure. So the reason I hit this pretty hard is there's a number of you that are thinking about generational effects and transgenerational things. So this is the way you should think about it. Okay? It takes a couple generations to have a generation which is nothing to do with an exposure, but it's truly just being passed through the germline. Okay? All right. So just to clarify for the toxicants, uh, I just showed here these eight. There's a whole series of other ones, tributyl tin, some hydrocarbon sort of mixtures. Also nutrition, both high-fat diets or caloric restriction will do it. Other labs have shown Temperature and drought in plants, smoking and alcohol will do it, stress, which I'll talk about in a little bit. This phenomena of epigenetic transgenerational inheritance has been shown in plants, flies, worms, fish, rodents, pigs, and humans. This is exceedingly conserved biological phenomena, which, which is what we expect. It's not going to occur only in one species. It's going to be across the board. And in fact, even more recently, there's some microbe work that have been shown to actually go uh, through epigenetics as well in terms of phenotypes in the microbes. And so this is a really highly conserved process, and dozens and dozens of other labs have shown the same phenomena. Now, you know, five, six years ago, I couldn't say that, so it was always an argument, but now it's, it's a little more justified. Okay. So now I'm going to switch. I've, I've discussed this generational effect going forward. So now I'm going to actually discuss the mechanism behind, okay? So if this was a, a genetic mutation, genetic mutations occur at frequencies of 0 0.001 generally. I gave it, I said 0 0.01 here because just being generous. Even in hot spots, it's only 1 or 2%, okay? So we were seeing 90% of the population. So there's no way genetics could do that, okay? Genetics occurs in a random event, okay? So this is very random in the genome. 
It, does, it basically, you don't get the same phenotype every time. And then for mammalian genetics, we should have seen the decline over time. For the epigenetics, this often occurs in 30 to 100% of the population. So epigenetics can actually affect the majority of the population. This is highly reproducible in terms of you get the same phenotype every time. And this does not fall in normal debt. So this appears to be what we were looking at. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you a few slides where I actually show the epigenetic analysis. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, we have all of these different epigenetic processes, DNA methylation, histones, chromatin structure, and non-coding RNAs. Turns out in the sperm, which we study extensively, the chromatin or histones are replaced by protamines, so they're not there. The, the DNA gets condensed down to sit in, the, hit it, sit in the head of the sperm, so it's basically lost. And the, and, the, and the genome is silent, so there's no non-coding RNA expression. So the one thing that goes through sperm is DNA methylation, so that's why we look at it. Okay? So I'm going to talk about DNA methylation extensively. So DNA methylation occurs, you, everybody hopefully knows the four base pairs in D DNA, is it a cytosine residue when it's next to a guanine, a CPG site. Okay? There's a methyl group that sticks right here on this uh, thymine, uh, uh, cytosine residue. Okay? And there's an enzyme called methyltransferase that actually puts that on there. When the cell divides and it's making a new st synthesis strand of DNA, there's methyl groups on that parental strand. Methyltransferase will come along and if it detects that methyl group, it methylates the new strand. So essentially it's replicating the epigenome at the same time it's replicating the DNA. So that's where that mitotic stability comes from. Okay? And so essentially the, these marks get put in there. Now, during development, we know that the, the, we should have actually figured this out 30, 40 years ago, because we know that when you bring an egg and a sperm together at fertilization, the first thing that happened was the DNA gets erased from the, meth, from the or excuse me, methylation gets erased from the DNA. And you basically, within a few cell divisions, it goes way down. This is what creates an embryonic stem cell. The reason embryonic stem cell is codipotent can turn into any cell in the body is you've removed the methylation and now it can remethylate in a cell specific manner. Okay, so we should have known that methylation was far more important than we thought before. Except there's a set of genes that are protected from the DNA methylation, the erasure. Those are called imprinted genes. And there's about four or five hundred that are known, and essentially they don't get demethylated, they're protected for it. We don't know exactly why or how, lots of people are looking at it. But basically, they're protected for it. So during during uh, fetal development, at the time of sex determination, when the gonad, the testis or ovary, are starting to develop in the fetus, there's also a demethylation of the cell, the precursor cell that's going to turn into a sperm or an egg. Then there's a remethylation in a male or a female specific manner to give you an egg or a sperm. Okay. So essentially, the, in fetal development, this is going on. So what we did during our exposures. So we expose during the tail end of the de de this erasure and the beginning of the remethylation. So essentially our exposures shifted the epigenetic programming of the germline. It became permanently programmed. Then it gets protected from erasure at fertilization and essentially keeps going generation to generation. So this is the mechanism behind this epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. Okay. So Everybody let that sink in. But there's developmental sort of effects of the methylation going up and down at these two times. And essentially, if you interfere with those and you modify those because of some environmental stressor, like stress, uh, you could actually shift the epigenetic programming. Okay? And it becomes permanent. And it goes from generation to generation. So we actually wanted to see, do we see epigenetic marks? So I won't go through this, but basically there's, there's assays that can actually look at the methylation in the DNA. So, so we uh, precipitate the methylated DNA, and now we actually use next-gen sequencing to actually look at it. So there's assays that are very expensive to actually do this sort of thing. So when we did this with the enclosalin, I'm just going to show this one map of the enclosalin. Here's all the different chromosomes from 1 to 20 and the X in the rat. Okay, and here's how big the chromosomes are, all those little arrows, all the links. So every time you see a red arrow is where we found an epigenetic mark that was changed with vinclozolin exposure versus control. So we saw over 200 epi epi 
what we call epimutations, because we've altered it permanently, so it's a mutation in the epigenome, going forward with this vinclozolin. So you have a signature there. Okay? So this basically showed that the sperm were carrying with it a shifted epigenome. Okay? And that becomes important in a minute. Now, you remember all those other things we looked at? Plastics, DDT, jet fuel, pesticides. Yeah, looked at whole different things. This was a big surprise for us. The only thing I want you to look at is in the middle, it's zero. And if you look on the outside of each one of these, the majority of the epimutations were exposure specific. So if you expose to DDT, there's an exposure specific signature of the epigenome versus vinclozolin. So guess what? Maybe in your 20s, we can determine what you or your great grandmother was exposed to to determine whether you got a shift in your epigenome and what your exposure was or some mix. So we can use these sort of as diagnostics for the exposure and then that'll potentially tell us what diseases you're going to get later in life as well. Okay? So, but this, this was a little bit of a surprise that we had this exposure specificity, but each compound we've tested has changed the epigenome of the germline. Okay? All right. So essentially we have this germline effect we have these epigenetic biomarkers for ancestral exposures because there was the great grandmother, or great great grandmother, uh, and then basically the next question is that how, what does this change do to what genes are on and off for the genome? Again, a complicated diagram. Don't worry about it. The only thing I want you to look at is the middle, zero and zero. So we took eleven different <laughs> tissues in males and females. We ran what genes are, were expressed in those tissues. And well, again, what we found was, here's a heart, kidney, liver, ovary, and uterus in a, test, in, in a female. Each one had a different effect on its, what genes are on and off. And again, there was no overlap. So essentially, we had about 200 epimutations, and we had, if you added all this up, 5,000 genes affected. So this really made us <coughs> wonder, what's going on here? Just in those 11 tissues, there's a lot more tissues in the body. So when we actually took all of those genes and mapped them on the genome, just like we did before, here's your chromosomes, here's the size of the chromosome, the green ones are females, the red ones are males, they started clustering together. All of these genes started clustering together. And so essentially, what we found was what we call an epigenetic control region. So there's an there's a, a, a epimutation here in the middle, the DNA methylation difference. And for several megabases, several million bases in either direction, this can actually influence gene expression. There's 50 genes in this region. There's four or five of them in the kidney, and those get influenced. There's different ones are in the, are in the mammary gland. There's different ones in, in the prostate and so forth. So it's the same region being affected, but different genes and different tissues are in the region. This is really very distinct from what genetics tells you in terms of here's a promoter and here's a gene. And this is all regulated through this promoter. What we're saying is there's a region, and we can influence those gene expressions really at a distance. So this is how a subtle change in the epigenome has very big effects on genome activity in terms of what genes are on and off. Okay? All right. So these are called the epigenetic control regions. Go for a couple megabases. So I want to give you one example of a tissue, because there's always the question, how does the epigenetics cause the disease? Okay? And so, so, in other words, how does this epigenetic transmission of disease occur? All right. So, if you think about this, you have the germline carrying with it an altered epigenetics, an altered methylation pattern, okay? which doesn't get erased. It generates the embryonic stem cell. The embryonic stem cell now that's going to determine every single cell in the body now has a different epigenome than it's supposed to. And every cell in the body now has a shifted epigenome and a shifted ex expression of what genes are on and off. So you've affected the whole organism from just affecting this germline carrying forward this epigenetics. Okay? So if that's the case, we should be able to pick any epithelial cell, map its epigenome and show there's a difference and map it at, at what genes are on and off and show it's a difference. So what we did is we took, in this particular case, the ovary. There's a cell type in the ovary which supports the develop, as the follicles develop, there's this oocyte that eventually gets ovulated. 
the granulosa cells or the somatic cell that actually support that developing oocyte. So we pulled, purified out the granulosa cells. And what we found was that there were about 100 epimutations in that germ cell, or in the granulosa cell. And there's about 500, or excuse, and there's about 500 genes that had altered gene expression. And when we looked, the majority of genes previously involved in ovarian disease and polycystic ovarian disease had been shown to be in that gene set. So, the, so this is like what genes were affected in terms of associated with the disease, but the reason they were affected is because of the shift in the epigenome. So essentially, this is what then drives this disease within these different tissues, okay? So again, we could then do diagnostics for different tissues to see what's the, what's the in your mammary epithelial cell, what does your epigenetics look like, and would you get a susceptibility for breast cancer for that? And so there's lots of things we could use this for in medicine. All right. All right. So I focused on a whole bunch of other somatic diseases, but now I want to focus on the brain and give you examples of behavior because this is what the conference is due for. Okay. So I'm going to talk about transgenerational behavioral reprogramming. Okay. Now, if we took the F3 generation of enclosal in animals, what, does it, what happens to their behavior? So the first thing we did is we took females and males. Don't worry about the graphs, I'll just tell you. But basically, here's females and males, and we ran a whole series of different tests. This turns to be a light, dark box. Rodents don't like to be outside in, it, in this light. They like to be in the corners of this box and in the dark, okay? So you can look at transition times into the light. You can look at time in the light versus the dark, all those sort of things. And essentially, what this told us is both the males and the females had a behavioral effect. And the behavior in the females was an increased level of anxiety. Okay? There, and there's a number of t other tests we ran with as well as this. The males was a decrease in the level of anxiety, just the opposite. So the males were decreased anxiety and higher risk takers. And the females had a much higher level of anxiety. Does that sound similar to the, maybe what's going on in the human population? <laughs> But essentially, that's what we found in these animals. So there was a direct effect on the brain in terms of anxiety behavior in both the males and the females. Okay? So then we did a different kind of experiment, which is very related, potentially, to PTSD <coughs> and several other diseases like this. What we did is we took the F3 generation animals, third generation, no chance of any exposure. They're transgenerational. And we actually took those animals, and we had, did a restraint stress put the animal in a little sort of restraint stress every day for a certain period of time for several weeks early in life. Then we, left, then we, we stopped doing this and let them live, like grow up a little bit older. And then we looked at a whole series of behaviors. Again, here's this light dark, dark box. And essentially what we found was that the vinclozolin dramatically shifted the response to the stress. So the animals had a different stress response because of this exposure of the great-grandmother, okay? So therefore, if you think about this, in the field, if you have PTSD, you have a whole bunch of, you know, a bunch of individuals, certain individuals are responsive to it, and certain individuals are not responsive to it. Could it be that there's an epigenetic basis for that responsiveness or not? It's not that the ancestral thing is gonna cause the PTSD, it makes them susceptible to get the PTSD, okay? Most diseases, like I just mentioned, it's susceptibility that's happening. The epigenome is changing it so the mammary gland now have a susceptibility to get mammary tumors, or there's a susceptibility for obesity. It's not causing it, it just makes, it changes the tissue, so now you have a susceptibility because of the disease. Same thing with PTSD. Okay. So this was a, more of a stress response transgenerationally. So in terms of your thinking about it transgenerationally, could it be a very traumatic event in history with a specific generation, could you actually shift not only you know, thinking about what happened at the time, but shift them physiologically for several generations to come? Okay? That changes the way you think about the transgenerational or intergenerational sort of situation for behavioral effects. Now, what we did then, we didn't stop there. I won't, won't go into detail. But essentially, we took most of the brain regions that were associated with those behaviors, pulled those regions out. We ran transcriptomes and epigenomes. And here it just shows the brain 
male brain and a female brain, a set of gene, genes that were present in nearly every single animal we looked at. And we took multiple different tissues as well. So the epigenetics was changing the programming of the brain, which is what you'd expect if you're going to have a behavioral effect. Okay? So we've done that on the molecular level too. Now just to clarify, stress is an equally important environmental exposure as you know. Okay? So here's just three studies in the past year or so which actually have a stress. This is maternal separation, early postnatal, which caused a transgenerational effect. Here's a traumatic paternal express. It was an odorant stress on, a, on adult males causing generational effects later on in the females, actually in males. There's a generational restraint, forced swimming and so forth. So there's a number of stress inducers for this transgenerational phenomena that have been identified in the last year or so, which directly correlates with a lot of the things you talk about if you think about traumatic events. Essentially, that's a traumatic stress event, particularly if it happens earlier in life. This is why later in life you have this potential behavioral effect. It's through this shift in the epigenome. Okay. All right, so in summary then, for the mechanism, for the disease, environmental factor affects this F0 generation female. The fetus that's in that female is undergoing this <coughs> DNA reprogramming during that time, and this gets changed, such that when it becomes an adult, it has this altered epigenetic programming in the sperm, which then gets passed to the next generation. Essentially, every single tissue, because it, this is now affecting the stem cell, Every single tissue now is a shift in its transcriptome, what genes are on and off. Those tissues that are sensitive to the, the, uh, to the shift will get disease, and those that are not won't. This individual then becomes an adult, and germline passes it on to the next generation, and so forth. So this is basically epigenetic inheritance, all right, causing these physiological effects. Now, so I just want to give you the one example of the DDT, so the DDT exposure of a gestating female have influenced through this germline effect, both in it found, we found that this goes through the male and the female. This was a no, no change in obesity in the first generation and 50% in, in the third generation. Now if you don't know, in the 1950s in North America, the entire population for over 10 years, maybe 12 or 13, got exposed to exceedingly high levels of DDT. Such higher levels than, than we would even think about today, thinking about it, and the entire population did. So we're three generations from the 1950s. In the 1950s, the obesity rate was, was 5% average okay, across the board. Today, 40% of the population has obesity. Now, it's not that the DDT caused the obesity or the epigenetics causes the obesity. It's a susceptibility thing. We have, we have examples where there's litters, three of the, of the offspring on the same exact diet, the same exact exercise, everything's the same. Three won't develop obesity and three will. So it's a susceptibility issue, okay? It's not that diet and exercise is an absolutely critical. That's what's gonna bring on the disease, but your susceptibility is actually programmed potentially from not only DDT, but there's a whole series of other things that'll do this as well. So if that's the case, could it be that a mess of our disease we see today is due to ancestral exposures. Not to say we don't have responsibility for lifestyle things to keep the disease down, but the susceptibility is actually programmed. Okay. So it completely changes how we think about some of these diseases. Okay. All right, so we have this environmental epigenetics influencing generational phenotypes. Sex determination for the germline is really critical. That's the time of when you're gonna shift it. We, this, provide, this epigenetics provides a molecular basis for this fetal, uh, fetal life effects or basis for adult onset disease. The periods are, for development are fetal, postnatal, or pubertal in terms of exposure sensitivities, different tissues. Whole series of diseases, whole series of behavioral effects, and, then, and I'm going to talk about mate preference here in a section. Now, it, when we get exposures, normally we're not going to affect our germ cells, okay? But we will affect our cells early in life. So essentially, there's a genetic process causing this, if you go from an early developing cell, let's say it's a mammary epithelial cell, essentially 
you have this early developing cell undergoing this cascade to get an adult, normal, differentiated mammary epithelial cell. If you got an exposure early in development at a critical window, this environmental factor can actually shift the epigenetics, which is also going through a cascade of development, and it interacts with the genome to influence gene expression, so you have an altered, environmentally modified, differentiated state with different gene expression. This causes a change in what genes are on and off and your susceptibility to develop disease. So our disease that we see in individuals can come from an early life exposure. It doesn't have to be your great grandmother, okay? And it's the same exact epigenetic sort of process involved. It's just at the level of the somatic tissues, not your germs of your sperm array, okay? So this epigenetic transgenerational inheritance for toxicology, we've never thought about the fact what happens to the next generation. It's always just in the individual exposed. So this is really a big eye-opener for the field of toxicology. In terms of, we permanently change the germline epigenome, which makes a big, that's a big deal in biology because you can shift the phenotypes of animals this way, which I'll talk about in a second. For disease etiology, I suspect epigenetics is going to be equally important as genetics, and we need to start thinking about it in that manner. Plus, we've got a whole series of new therapeutic and diagnostic targets we never had before. Now, it, it's not that, uh, it's easy to look at disease, but here's another biological process for, in evolution that I want to just mention, show you two slides. The first study was done in collaboration with David Cruz down at UT Texas Austin. So we took the F3 generations and we actually looked at mate preference. For evolution, that's a big deal. Darwin, his, one of his first books, <coughs> was on the role of sexual selection in evolution. It was one of the main determinants. So this is why birds have plumage and they sing. Different animals have different courtships and so forth. It's for mate preference, okay? And most animals do, including rodents. So he actually measured the mate preference. So here's an example of a female. In this middle, there's a wire mesh sort of thing. And here's a, here's a male that's from the control lineage. And here's a male from the vinclosal lineage. So you put the female in there. I won't show the videos and things, but basically it shows whether there's a preference by how much time it spends on one side versus another side and sort of smelling and all sorts of things, okay? And what we found was in, in most mate preference situations, the female is generally the discriminant sex. They're the ones doing the choosing, okay? The males generally will mate the first male female that comes along. There's no choosing involved. You could say, well, maybe that's the same thing in the human population. <laughs> But essentially, uh, what we found was that 100% of the females, whether it was from the, from the control lineage or the vinclosal lineage, F3s, selected control generation males, and not the vinclosal ones, okay? So we essentially shifted the mate preference of the animals, okay? So if you can affect mate preference and sexual selection, essentially, this would be a significant driver for an evolutionary event. Okay? Certain populations of individuals would be selected versus others. So that was our first evolution sort of concept. Uh, then recently, because of that, I wanted to pick th what's the iconic evolution model. It's Darwin's finches, okay? Because this, and we went to the Galapagos and the Darwin's uh, and collected Darwin's finches. Here's the phylogeny of a whole series of Darwin finches, There's about 13 of them. Now there actually is a new look and there's 16 of them. And what we did is we chose five different species that were in completely different unrelated clades. And we took and basically collected red blood cells from Darwin fin. We don't kill the Darwin fin. They don't allow us to do that at all. <laughs> you, just, you just bleed the animal, get a little blood, and then you can basically go back and do your epigenetics. And so essentially what we found, if you look at the blue, which is your epigenetics, or excuse me, your genetics, we looked at genetic mutations. When we looked at the epigenetics in the red, there's a direct linear correlation with the number of epigenetic changes with the phylog phylogeny, which is not as linear with the genetic changes, and there's more epigenetic changes. So we did this mostly to tell the evolution field, you have to start thinking about ev epigenetics. It could be an equally important role in evolution than just genetics. And that's been a really hard sell so far. <laughs> Hope, hopefully in the next five years we can convince them as too, but it's, it's, it's a slow process for the evolution people. But I think that because the genome functions through both of these things, both of them are going to be involved. Okay? So 
we have epigenetics influencing the essentially you have the environment affecting these epi mutations that are now in the genome it affects what genes are on and off and then essentially that affects your physiology it can you can have an abnormal physiology which will lead to a disease state or you can have an increased phenotypic variation instead of this sort of bell curve, you can increase the bell curve by having additional phenotypes by influencing your epigenetics. This has a direct impact then on natural selection and evolution. So it's going to affect really all of biology. It's not just disease. It's going to be everything, which is, again, if it's really important, that's what you'd expect. Okay? All right. So then, if you have these epimutations in your genome, from ancestral exposures or whatever, these are your ancestral ghosts. So hopefully you understand what the ancestral ghosts are. Okay. So there is an actual reason for that. Okay. So with that, I want to thank a very a large lab that does all the work. I just get the luxury of talking about it and finding funding for them. Uh, and then a whole series of collaborators that, that uh, have done the same. Okay. With that, I'll finish and happy to answer any questions. Okay. So I was wondering, you're talking about this goes to uh, F3. How long do you know you go goes uh, right for F5? Or do you know how long? Sure. We've taken it out. Uh, we don't do any inbreeding. It turns out inbreeding depresses the epigenetics, and so we keep everything outbreak. So just to go to F3s or F5s. Uh, you have to have a whole lot of animals, and it's very expensive. So I've taken it out to about 10. However, this also occurs in C. elegans and Drosophila, which are two experimental models in biology. They've taken it out 20 to 25 generations and shown that. The classic, however, is Linnaeus in the late, in the mid-1700s. He's the father of taxonomy. He studies plants. He actually did a heat exposure to a plant, causing a flowering change in the, in the plant. He isolated that, and, it was, and that was stable for him. So he saved it, of course, because he was a taxonomist, one of the first. And it's been propagated for 200 generations over, the over time. They took the current one, and they went back to the original one that he collected. Guess what? It was an epimutation put in place up, up front, and it's the same epimutation today. So that's 200 generations. Yeah, but this mutation is in DNA or in somewhere else? It's a methylation of the DNA change. It's an epigenetic shift. Right. OK. I have a quick question. Um, I'm here. This <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so the first question I would have is that, um, so what part of the time in the life cycle, what part of the time in the life cycle um, these damages are the permanent damages. So I would assume that um, sperm generation, the process of sperm generation has Correct. changed. Correct. Um, so let's say if a person has been exposed for, let's say, one month out of his life of uh, 20 years. So right. after 20 years, uh, that's a permanent damage. Correct. So, um, so the way to think about not only epigenetics, but genetics as well, or most things, um, earlier life events, the fetal period, early postnatal period, the pubertal period, those are developing events. So the stem cell for the mammary epithelial cell or the prostate cell comes up at the onset of puberty and it starts to develop, okay? Most organs develop in the fetus and there's a few postnatally as well. So when those early developmental periods are occurred is when those tissues are most sensitive to an environmental stressor or just stress, okay? And so then you can almost pick, if there's a stress at the age of five, you can almost predict what tissues are going to be affected because we know that those are the ones undergoing development. Or if it's at onset of puberty, it's the same thing. Okay? If it's in the fetus, most tissues are, a lot of tissues are. For the germ cell to get it programmed, it requires an early fetal period. It corresponds to about six weeks to 18 weeks of gestation in the human. Okay? So that's your first trimester sort of period. Okay? And so, so, but what I'm saying is think about it is environmental effects on the epigenetics or genetics really is more of a developmental process. So if you want to think about when is it most important, 
It's when it's developing. Now, unfortunately, this is really the sad thing is, the brain starts to develop in the early fetus and it goes till after puberty. It's the longest developmental period of any organ system. So, unfortunately, the brain is sensitive throughout all that time. And any of those exposures during that time can affect brain development going forward. Now, in the adult, the germ cell in the testis is undergoing development constantly. So with the adult male, you can get a, a germ cell effect on the, on the sperm. For females, they're somewhat protected because the oocytes are sort of are in this special stage of development where they protect themselves from it. So they still are sensitive to it, but they're not completely, I mean, completely, there are certain things which will, will affect it. <clears throat> and I have the quick question on the um, slide before that. Um, on the one more. Uh, this natural selection. Uh, so when you say physiology, so it means uh, females prefer male who are stronger and bigger? No, no, no. Okay, so natural selection, uh, according, this is Darwinian theory, it acts on a population that has like a bell-shaped curve. So you have phenotypes where you have small individuals and large individuals. There's a whole series of different phenotypes within the population. There'll be an, an environmental factor maybe nutrition, maybe high temperature, whatever, which actually then goes in, is going on, and it, a certain phenotype within that population or group of phenotypes can adapt to it and survive better than the other ones, okay? So simply increasing the variation with epigenetics increases your chance for natural selection and evolution, okay? It's not predicting which one's gonna be selected, it just is increasing your variation, okay? Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a, a bunch of different thoughts, but I'll try to focus in on something that you had brought up and really focused on the whole idea of susceptibility. So I'm coming at this from a, the field of psychology. And I took um, a two week course at NIH on health disparities. And one of the things that had come up, obviously epigenetics, but thinking about African American women mm -hmm. and how um, there's low birth weight for babies, mm -hmm. right? And higher rates of um, you know, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. premature births, all those sorts of things. All and right. so um, we thought, okay, here are generations of slavery and all discrimination mm -hmm. that has in fact impacted this population. So I'm feeling kind of stuck there. We know that these things are happening, but how are they being translated? And no one could really come up with clear evidence that it could be potentially because of these social determinants, right? right? To so, a certain extent. Yeah. But, and then I have, I'll relate that to the bigger, well, for this conference at least, thinking about war trauma. Mm -hmm. too. And so I guess that's where I'm sort of impatient with some of the science and how do we bridge those two together yeah. to say there's evidence to suggest it's the susceptibility, but I'm feeling stuck there. Like what else can we actually right. connect that with, with the things that we're seeing now? Sure. So for the Af African American community, it's not just women. Men have, I think, twice the level of prostate disease than the white population. So there's a whole series of diseases that are sort of discriminant in terms of the race. Uh, now, finding out what the origin of that difference is, that's a whole different thing. Now, it's possible if we ran epigenetics, we could show whether there's an epigenetic shift. In a rat model, we can actually do that because here's the original and here's the, here's the treated. But in a human population, finding that origin is going to be tough. So just saying that it's definitely you know, slavery for the African American body, that's a tough, tough sell. It could be just as much genetics brought in as well. So I, I don't know if you're going to be able to get at the origin, but I think much of that shift, the two, two or three times higher levels, is probably epigenetics helping that susceptibility to occur. That's something we could study, and so far, nobody's really studied that. So what about war trauma? Right. You know, that would be the Holocaust, that, you know, yeah. something with the Irish right. And so the way, the way, the way I, pr I, I predict that it's going to be epigenetics is if you took you know, a hundred military individuals, and they w went through the same event, it'll be a subpopulation that gets PTSD, and some of them won't. These, won these are sensitive to that. The sensitivity to that is probably this epigenetic process, whether it's ancestral or early life exposure in that individual or whatever. But that susceptibility is probably an epigenetic process. If, if it wasn't, if it wasn't, if it was genetic, the, theoretically, it would be a much wider sort of swath. And so, so that's why I think that it's probably a subpopulation because of this 
could be an ancestral thing or whatever. And, th and then in thinking about trauma affecting intergenerational behavioral things, which is what many of you are thinking about, start thinking about the fact that it may not be, it could be these ancestral traumas caused an epigenetic shift, which is then leading to these things in subsequent generations. It's something we need to think about. Certainly hasn't been shown, it's speculative, but uh, it's something we, I think that's appropriate to look at. Do you know anyone who's doing work in that area? I just feel so stuck in that. Position. No, these, these stress papers that I mentioned were just like one, just one year old. And so the, str the field of stress and trauma is just now thinking about epigenetics in animal models. So nothing's reached the humans yet. Hi, um, I was just wondering if there's any research kind of looking the other way, so at any um, exposures or experiences that can elicit positive outcomes or, uh, right. you know, susceptibility against diseases sure. or that, if there's any research in that area. Sure. So um, none of our diseases are generally 100%. They're always 90% or, you know, or, or less. And so there's always people that say, well, what about the 10% that didn't get it? It'd be a really nice question to ask, but we haven't gone that far yet. Uh, and so that's a really interesting thing. Is there a population that's resistant to it or are there, are there positive things and so forth put in place or not? It's really hard to look for positive things, okay? It's really easy to look for disease. And so that's why we pretty much study disease. Now, you can say, well, if a male is lower level of anxiety and risk taking, there's a lot of males that would say that's a good thing. Well, whether it's good for the long-term survival of that individual, it's hard to say. But and so, so some things that, you know, in other words, it's somewhat an, in, an issue of whether you think it's a good thing or not, okay? The disease susceptibility probably is setting us up for the fact that we have a large variation in the epigenome, higher levels of disease, which if you think about it, might actually be very nice in an evolutionary event. Because some of the diseases would actually be advantageous depending on the situation. The, one of the things for obesity is there's a thrifty gene hypothesis that developed a baby 30 years ago, where if you take an individual and you put them under caloric restriction and they're born, they basically, if you keep them on that lower level of a caloric restriction, they become more normal from what the parent was in terms of was exposed. So they're essentially programming themselves to live in the air where there's not that much food. Evolutionarily, that makes sense, okay? Now, you put that individual back on a high regular diet, Oof, they have an increase in obesity coming on, okay? So the obesity could be advantageous depending on the environmental pressure. So, so it's hard to say whether it's positive or negative, but... Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I read about a study, I'm not a scientist in any way, but I read about a study in Sweden that was looking at hysterical reptiles and how they found that... Correct, correct, that correct, correct. Yeah, children who correct. Were Right, it's Mark, Mark, Marcus Pimbury from the UK. Real nice. It's one of the first studies in humans showing generational effects, correct. And was all, he's also done the smoking thing as well in human population. And yes, they did several, de there was a famine, and then essentially the famine went away, and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of disease two or three generations later, correct. Also, if you're not aware, during World War II, um, I listened to a talk this, this afternoon by someone from the Netherlands. So basically, there was, a, there was a Holland famine which occurred, and they've actually taken women that had a child during the famine versus outside the famine. And those children that were born during the famine have increased disease two generations later. More metabolic disease, basically, a couple of different things. Uh, thank you. A very interesting presentation. I would expect uh, there are many layers of this kind of epigenetic factors which influence each other. How do we determine like which which are the relevant ones? For example, like uh, one, uh, like for example, BHP has been identified at the point as being sure. bad, but before not. So, uh, and can you provide some examples of what would be some of this obviously relevant? Okay, so you're asking which epigenetic process, whether it's DNA methylation, histones, or that? Is that what you're asking? Uh, for, for example, I, I would or expect what the from those factors that you described, for example, BHP and stress and so on, right. in, in, in any given individual at the point will be a whole bunch of them in, interacting, like which one 
Correct. Which one is the relevant well, one? Well, you remember, so we took, uh, we took a, an, a fungicide exposed to gestating female. Three generations later, the males and females had different stress responses from the control. So I don't know, it probably is lots of things that will actually induce that kind of phenomena. And so I, probably we're not going to get down to an individual compound. It could be just certain sort of exposures that might do it ancestrally that, that sh would shift that. In our model, that's what we would say, or sort of say. But it also can be in that individual. If that individual early postnatally for five years was exposed to certain types of chemicals, which most of us are in today's world, uh, certain types of chemicals might induce that type of event. So it's hard to put your finger again on what caused it. What I would sort of think about more is, think about this. So could you actually take a population of military, do an epigenetic diagnostic assay, and determine which individuals would be sensitive to PTSD? You probably could if you actually had the populations to study. Okay? So I think that the epigenetics is going to give us diagnostics down the line to help us figure out how to treat patients, whether they're resistant or not to this drug or whatever, that we just don't have today. It's sort of like preventative medicine sort of thing. Okay? In terms of, uh, right. In, in terms of putting, I, I would sort of, I sort of take a different view. What, what, what developmental stages are the most sensitive? There's probably lots of different environmental factors that'll do it if it hits it at that developmental stage. And so I would take it, I would start there. Once you've figured that out, then you can start to piece apart what may, factors might be more important. But it's, there's so little research on the topic that I can't really gauge which one's more important or not at this stage. Um, the question, oh. Um. The question I had was around, um, she talked, asked a little bit about the positive effects of my, my methylonation, and you talked about how that process, it demethylinates when you create the stem cell, but somehow these changes don't go away. And you mentioned one factor, like when people inbreed, I guess, that it tends to go away a little Correct. bit. But are there other known factors? Because I'm interested in how would you stop the process, you know, like mm -hmm. instead of it being a death knell and just a temporary change, like, because I know people do try to detoxify sure, sure. or try to do something healthy, like, you know, with themselves sure. to change. No, I understand. Yeah. So um, majority of those, remember you have all these effects that come along during your lifespan. Right. The major, vast majority get reset at each generation for DNA methylation, uh -huh. okay? Except for a small set of these imprinted-like sites, and we've induced new imprinted-like sites, essentially. Right. Okay. And so most of it does get reset at the next generation. You shouldn't think that everything is generational. In fact, most things are probably not. And that they may, you may get a disease and so forth, but that's not necessarily going to go on to your next generation. So I would not get, don't think that everything's going to be generational. Would that mean, I mean, I'm thinking of stem cell therapy or something mm -hmm. like that because it Correct. could introduce the biggest, a new. The biggest problem um, right now with stem cell therapy is if you pull an embryonic stem cell out and you put it in culture, guess what? Its epigenome changes. So therefore, if you use it for therapy, the tissue that you develop or the cell that you develop has a shifted epigenome because of the manipulation of the stem cell. This uh -huh. is a big problem that they've realized over the past five years. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's, they're going to have to figure that out before they do too much. Now, you still, if you do stem cell therapy now for spinal sort of stuff, um, and you extend the lifespan or you can treat the disease when there's no other treatment, stem cell therapy is a good thing. I'm not saying it's not. It's just that there is, it is not a completely clean treatment. And then this is just a today. little, huh, this is just a little relation to this. So is there um, a sort of, like you talked about the birds having epigenetic change that seems to be a natural change and that makes them their species, but these are induced by chemicals. Is there a different characteristic of Nutrition, right. Nutrition and temperature and all sorts of normal environmental things from the environment can shift the epigenome. In fact, nutrition is probably our biggest environmental exposure we have. When you ate the food out there, you probably took down a thousand different compounds. There were natural compounds. 
but what your levels change because of what you ate. So nutrition is a big deal. And so historically, that's probably been our biggest temperature and nutrition and so forth has been our biggest sort of environmental factor. And stress, probably, too. Okay, we're going to take just two more questions, and then actually we're going to go back to the free-for-all and head back to the food. So <laughs> one here. Wow, you just blew my mind. <laughs> so thank you. Um, okay, over here. Um, what I wanted to, I'm really interested actually is in, in the effects, when we talk about trauma, trauma brings on suffering. You know, that's one of the responses. Some people suffer a lot. Um, we also, you mentioned military, but there's also the communities that are affected by those military sure, actions sure. and Absolutely. they may be suffering Absolutely. a lot more. Absolutely. Um, but what, what I'm really trying to get at, and why I'm kind of, I'm a civil engineer delving into this realm, um, is what's the effect of that suffering Okay, on people's brains, you mm -hmm. know, true to generations. Because it's, you know, I've, I've the sense for a long time that it's got to have an effect. And it looks like what you've kind of mapped out here, there could be something. Yeah. And then if you look at certain regions, you know, does it affect your consciousness? Does it affect mm -hmm. you know, like community consciousness? How does it affect regions? And then you start looking at the craziness in the world. Can we map out some of that? I mean, sure. Um. So the way to think about cell, you know when you're exposed when you're in your 30s and 40s to bisphenol A, all sorts of chemicals or stress and so forth, we're fairly resilient as adults to not have an effect generally. The reason is, is most of the cells in your body, including your brain, have differentiated. So once they differentiate, you can't easily shift it, okay? You can cause chronic effects and, you know, so toxic effects and things like that. And, and potentially the tra trauma is a toxic sort of thing. But it's not like you're reprogramming the cell. This is why it's much more of an earlier life thing that where it's developing and you change it and all of a sudden it goes a different path. That's why those, those are much more sensitive periods. So in terms of, but any time, any kind of trauma, whether it's military, whether it's, you know, you know, genocide, some, I mean, it's all sorts of, you know, trauma is trauma to a degree in terms of ability to shift it. But I would say, and I don't know, you can tell me, that your younger generation is probably much more sensitive to it than the older generation in terms of then later in life having a whole series of effects than what the adult generation did. So that's why I would, again, take a more developmental view of the problem and think about when was the trauma, how old they were, and is this going to have a certain phenotype then at this age, which will have a much bigger phenotype potentially later on? I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, two points. One is the if has to do with the, uh, if there is a difference, if the epigenetics cause a difference, you get more rapid evolution. You get more rapid evolution with epigenetics you should be able to model it. Or sh mm -hmm. Has anybody done the differences between, there's computational. Evolutionarily. Uh, there's right. computational evolution. Joan Roughgarden was here. Right, so yeah. Uh, and would you see, uh, has anybody done it and shown a difference? So. Um, or do you have enough data to start for right, it's, it? Um, our data, that's only a year old study on the, on the finch. Um, the field of evolution, uh, for whatever reason, is they're really locked into genetics. And the reason is all of their models, every, almost everything other than maybe two years ago, everything before, was totally genetic models. You have to realize if somebody spends 20 years doing a modeling and they only use genetics and you come along and say, well, you missed this, they're not going to necessarily want to do their thing again, okay? So. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's just a knee-jerk reaction, and every field has that sort of thing. So it was only about two years ago, a few people started to put epigenetics into the models, and they, they can explain more things than they can with just genetics. So I think with time, it's probably going to take five, five or six more years, the field now is going. Now, I must say, when we published our stuff in genetics and evolution, five, ten papers in the field, you know, then, now, just in the past year, there's almost 200 papers in epigenetics and evolution. So it's just going exponential here. So I don't think it's going to be too long, and we're going to see all the models have evolution. All the phylogenies will have epigenetics in it. It'll become much more common uh, going forward. The other point is uh, in a different direction. There are some fish and reptiles 
that will change the ratio of the sexual uh, ratio between males and females mm -hmm. depending on temperature. what uh, depending on temperatures. Right, both what the turtles and al time alligators will uh, do that too. Right, some fish and uh, possibly even parthenogenesis also. So it turns out sex determination for some species is very much temperature related. Tem turtles and alligators and some fish. Uh, in the gonad that generates the steroids, that generates the endocrinology of the fish, the promoters for a number of the steroidogenic enzyme, one of them is aromatase that makes estrogen, gets turned on epigenetically by temperature. So essentially that sex determination is again the epigenetics working with the genetics to give you the phenotype. Wonderful. Thank you all. We're going to ask those who still have questions to hold them and to ask them over the reception, which we're going to begin soon. And it is um, hosted by MAP. So thank you, MAPS. And thank, uh, help me thank Michael Skinner once again for this. Thank you. Thank you.